Welcome today to the Unashamed Podcast of Phil Robertson. Of course, we've got Al and Jace along for the ride as well. Uh, today's episode is, uh, <laughs> you're going to like it. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the Battle of the Beavers, uh, which is an ongoing uh, battle that's been going on for us for many years. Uh, somehow that led us to the uh, the, the ark uh, back in Genesis 6 and talking about Noah and the flood. Uh, and baptism uh, as well. So, man, we got a lot of topics today on the podcast. So, we're glad you tuned in. So, uh, Dad, just so you know, um, according to what I'm looking at here, seventy billion dollars of taxpayer money will be spent on public education. Yet, a new report finds that just two in five American students are ready to attend college. Does that does that surprise you that seventy billion dollars being spent and yet not even half of students that are out there are not ready for college? Seventy billion dollars, and you say, what kind of people are we looking at? It they were taught to rebel. They were taught that America's not exceptional at all. They were taught that America is not a great place. They were taught to replace America with anything as long as God is left out. They were taught. They were trained to be socialists. You say, how would you? Uh, look around and you got a 22 year old and why is he all in with Karl Marx? You said someone taught him that. Well, now you've just unleashed a fact. All these billions of dollars are coming out of these bureaucrats, the department of education. That's who taught him that. Right. You're like, something is bad wrong with. So you look at who's teaching the children. You look at public schools. Obviously, there's a major problem. There's a group called Freedom Project Academy. And I love their line here, Dad. It says the kind of education that we're looking at is to teach students how to think, not what to think. So this group is an accredited online school. It's built on Judeo-Christian values. Uh, Basically, it's an online group. They're saying, look, we got to figure out how the founders made us and start teaching people how to think. You got to remember they were never taught this crop that's running around, the millennials, they call them. Right. You say, were they ever taught anything about the founding fathers? They don't know who George Washington, Thomas Je- John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, right. <clears throat> Jane Madison, they never heard of. Except they were slave owners and terrible people. Oh, yeah. That we should tear all their statues down. We keep teaching them this, saying, what in the world's happening to our country? Well, who's teaching your children? And what are they teaching them? Exactly well, I just right. gave you a little list. Look, here's how long this list is. I just <laughs> jotted down a few notes. I didn't know you were going to be on this topic. I just had this for a little reserve here this morning. I'm well, fired up for whatever I got here. So when freedomforschool.com, if you go there, freedomforschool.com, uh, you can check out, get free information for the school. Their enrollment is going to end July 19th, so you don't want to wait around. you got to jump on this thing quickly. Good uh, for them. They've also got a weekly podcast, The Dr. Duke Show. You can get it on iTunes. So July 19th, you got to get there before then. Take back control of your child's education. Freedomforschool.com. That's freedomforschool.com. And see so how are you going to get them out of the public school system? This group may help because I, I just tell people, homeschool your children and go to Christian schools. What what does this group, how are they going to do? That's what they do. I mean, basically, they're doing what you're saying, except now they're saying you can go online. They've got exams. They teach. They do all these different ways, but they're doing it. and That's one way around the Department of Education. you got to remember, my major is education. Right. And I'm looking at it now, and I'm horrified by what I'm seeing. I'm saying, whatever happened to good teachers? Well, I, for one, got out of it. The pay was low. Uh, you know, this government stuff started. I said, you know, check into that. So, you never made it. No. I, 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 Freedomforschool.com. Check it out. I am unashamed. What about you? All right, so, Dad, you just launch in. Yeah, because I, I want to hear this, but I just thought. Well, we'd... most people don't really think in terms when they speak of judgment they, they'll say something like they'll blame anything on mother nature uh, instead of God this is divine power over nature of at a touch freeze trees are fried I mean just like you sprayed them with roundup calming storms just think about if you had the ability to calm storms In other words, he marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. 
Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the wombs? This is in the book of Job. When I said, this far you may come, speaking to the water, and no farther. Here's where your proud waves halt. So you start down through there and you look at all these things. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, Psalms 148.8. Stormy winds that do his bidding. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who's gone up to heaven and come down? Who's gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who's wrapped the waters in his cloak? Who's established all the ends of the earth? What's his name? What's the name of his son? Mark 4, 39. He got up, Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. The wind died. It was completely calm. Well, you look at that. Fire, drought, floods. You say the bugs, pestilence, all kinds of you know, turn loose, turn water into blood. I mean, you just start down the list of frogs. You're like, what in the world? <laughs> I feel like I walked in on the middle of a conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> the conversation is we pull up to our duck blind, <laughs> one of about 60 duck blinds. I pull up there. The eunuch is with me. A millennial, a wayward, a straight millennial gasping for air in a, in a mighty throng of millennials that's forgotten where <laughs> – they this came is the from, guy that you, you hired. He worked I for me. I hired right? him. He works for me. So we pull up on this thing, <laughs> huge duck blind, 25 foot long, six foot wide, roof and all. I go around on the back where you come in, Jace, on your end where yeah. you hunted this year. Yeah. I crawled up in there, and I looked to my left. Which is very courageous. Yeah, I'm and, on and, my hands and, and knees. And There's and floodwaters. The floodwaters, so I'm watching for varmints of all kinds, cottonmouth. And I look down in there, wasp up on the roof. You know, I'm watching for him. <laughs> and I'm looking, and I said, how in the world could a group of animals do what I'm looking at? Where I stand, Jace, down there, where I, on my end, where I usually stand, you got to remember the old floors have rotted out, and we just throwed some plywood on them enough to make the duck season last year. We have subsequently tore all that out, replaced all that with plywood, treated plywood. That's a 40-year-old duck blind. But the beavers had moved into that duck blind. I guess they they swam up, come out of the water where, where our dog comes up on the boat, on the dog ramp. Well, how deep is the water right there? The water right now right there is about 13 feet deep and falling. So the beavers have no place to stay they so. they swam up in there looked around and said you know what we have a roof yep. <laughs> the floor is pretty rough shape but we can go through these holes in the floor bringing these sticks and stuff in here and why don't we just move in on this dude it's his house let's build our house inside his house because <laughs> he's done a pretty good job here no rain on us and which blind is this that's the 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 little cypress lake where me and oh, you and the, the one you spend on your knees. One now. in the back end down there. <laughs> That's the, my, yeah. the, the worst. The nurse mind. practitioner, you and I and he, we had some good shoots in there. Yeah. Even in the deep well, water. We need a higher roof. Higher roof. Well, yeah. So the floor is gone. It's all rotted out. But the beavers have built this thing. Where I stand, it was about chest high up to the shooting porch. It ran towards you halfway. What, limbs? And L- solid brush. The beavers had come in there one limb at a time. And began to strategically place that way down in there. I said because when I would pull up there to it, including that day, the nutri rats and the beavers would begin to head out from it. Well, I've got the twenty-two. Pop, 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 pop. I'm trying to get them. So Dan and I waded in on that. I said, "We'll do what old Jay's does. We'll use this beaver dam material, yeah, and to brush the blind, because we'll take it from the inside." And throw it in every direction, and we'll have all this beaver dam on our duck blind. So I said, no use in throwing away good brush. So we use the beaver dam brush. But here's my point. You say, how in the world, in the evolutionary chain of events, are you going to come out with with one of these furry animals, a four-footed furry animal? I mean, he has teeth that cuts down trees. Like a... Chainsaw, in like his a mouth. chainsaw. I mean, big trees, and then 
take them, cut them in two, drag them. They dragged thousands of pounds. That thing must have weighed thousands of pounds. They brought mud in and packed it in there, you yeah. know. I mean, they're so, architects, uh, some of the greatest architects in the world. So you know? when you look at, you know, what what could God can do, how he works through nature and all that, well, I'm just looking at a bunch of beavers that have decided to build a gigantic house inside my duck blind without my permission, by the way. <laughs> Squatters. And that's why I'm in there. Pop, pop, pop. I'm, I'm saying, we, 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 we got to take them out. Cause <laughs> Not up in my house. <laughs> so I got it all out of there. We cleaned it all up. I put a new floor on it. and uh, But it was about a uh, the whole time frame from the time we went in there and looked at it. The whole time frame was probably a week's bunch of work to get all the beaver <laughs> stuff out, put our stuff in, and go from there. But so I mean, please tell me you filmed this for In the Woods. Did we you, did filmed you film? it, and the audience right, will be so able to. So you can see it on In the Woods if you want to see this whole thing play out. My point is God works through, the, you know, I've said this before, I think, on the podcast, the largest animal-made structure on planet Earth, planet Earth. It's a beaver dam in Canada that runs over a mile long, and you can see it from outer space. A huge thing out in the middle is like 10 or 12 feet high. Where is it in, Canada? It's in Canada, yeah. in the middle of nowhere, but they've made a gigantic lake in front of it, of course, because they've stopped up. But it's not like dam it up or like a river. They just dammed up a kind of like an offshoot out there in a big marshy-looking area. But the thing is over a mile long. Wow. If you if you took all of that debris and mud and logs and sticks out, it would be millions of tons that they've hauled a varmint just about that long, about that big around, webbed feet. He has webbed feet, teeth that cuts down trees, a flat tail that he can haul mud with and pack. I mean, you said, yeah, boy, the old the old evolutionist. <laughs> he 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 he'll have a Time researching that thing. <laughs> well, yeah, how he got that. I mean, his DNA is to do that. And what's crazy to me is like when you got that place down there and and you had to figure out how to control the water because we want the water during duck season and then we want to pull the water off. Yep. You put your dump and your levee exactly where the beavers had already set up. We I mean, They we, had it figured out. We wanted to know the precise place to put our f control system where we could hold the maximum amount of water. And I told my buddy, Mac Owen, one of the brothers, I said, probably the beavers, where they've got that dam, that's probably where we should put our flood control structure. I said, because they've already shot this thing. We've got a laser transit with us, <laughs> a piece of equipment. I said, but the beavers probably have already shot it with eyeballed it. And I said, but I bet they're close. We shot that whole area with that laser transit. And o. Owen said, Robinson, where that beaver dam is, is precisely where this laser transit says you need to put your flood control structure. You, you hold the maximum amount of water right there where that beaver dam is. The beavers already knew it. Now, you just think of a furry. He, he's stinking. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he knows this will hold the maximum amount of water. It's not over there. We're going to put it right here. Well, you say, how did he get the ability to do that? Well, if you only had some way of being able to build, instead of having this adversarial relationship that you have with beavers, if you could just yeah. somehow have a way to you are work correct. with them. I mean, if they could ever come on board. You are correct. Forget yeah, about war, rednecks. The war started when it all came down to who's going to run this. That's right. That's right. Because I noticed when you put your dump where they already had a dam, the first thing they did was try to dig a hole in your dump so they could put their stuff in it. They didn't like what you did. They didn't like what I did. <laughs> they would not work with me. I, I declared war on them and a and this mighty... Is a, this is a 25-year war, so this is, this is going <laughs> yeah. way back. 25 years ago, I got so fired up about it that Miss Kay put a couple of pictures up. <laughs> One of them was a beaver. And the other one was me sitting there, and we, they were faced off the on the wall down there. She yeah. put it on the wall where I built duck calls, and she wrote up above there, who will win? Well, fast forward, it's been 30-something years. About 35 years later, I'm here to report to our audience that 
the beavers won the contest. <laughs> yeah. Where they, did they keep coming they from? Just, they <laughs> kept coming to the point to where now, now they're building houses inside my houses over there. I said, <laughs> okay, all right. So this year, for the first time, they've been wanting to make that area a permanent pool, a lake. Yep. I've been cutting it out, their dams out with track hose and then Red and I are down there with rain. When they do that, they kill the timber, which they is kill the, the timber, which right. they bout. But have. it's a natural thing. I mean, they were built to to make lakes. Well, they replaced the pin oak trees with cypress trees, but it just takes fifty years. They got the ability somewhere. Someone says, "Well, that the evolutionists would say it just they just evolved and learned." To, but you'd still have to have the teeth to cut down the trees. And the tail, and the flat tail, and, and the flat you, tail, and the web feet. I mean, you would have to have a varmint that could do that. And they said, "Well, yeah," but they had this abstract in their mind. Uh, one of these days, I'll be. I'm a little bitty thing now, and my tail is round, and uh, <laughs> my teeth can't cut down trees. But I'm gonna give myself a couple of million years, uh, and no. one day in the future, I'll be able to dam up put dams that are a mile long and 10 foot high and seen from outer space. i'll be able to do that and i'll just evolve and somehow or another pick that up i'll be just an animal that makes lakes i just think when you look at it logically you say some design. kind of mind designed that yeah. thing it makes me think of that verse hebrews 3 4 it says every house is built by someone but God is the builder of everything. That's it. Because the beaver actually perfect just, verse. It, he he builds a house. He have a you house. ever crawled up in one of their houses? I have cut holes to where I could see up in there. The only reason I haven't crawled up in them like the guy, the uh, the old mountain men movie. Jeremiah Johnson. One I, of them. One of them hid from the Indians by going up in that chute. Yeah. Up yeah. under it, <coughs> you got a house <coughs> made out of sticks. A big thing. There's a hollow place where all the weavers get up in there and sit around and eat limbs, eat willow limbs. Well, that old <laughs> that old mountain man went through that little little cut right there and got up in there. The Indians came up there and didn't know where he went, so they didn't find him because he hid up in there. The reason I don't that was in the north, that was in the Rocky Mountains, down in Louisiana. You crawl up in a beaver dam. <laughs> There's cotton all mouth. you have to do is pull up there and just hit it on top of it with a pole. And everything. And cotton mouths are coming out in every direction. I mean, yeah. like I've seen as high as ten or twelve cotton mouths come out of one beaver house. So you don't crawl up in there. Like, so the well, cotton mouth well, did it. Yeah. Did they bite the beavers? I mean, it seemed like they wouldn't live well. Together. I would. I would. I would th think they'd be bitten. Yeah, well, maybe. But I don't see beavers floating around. Dead That's what I'm saying. Unless there was a bullet, and they couldn't them. swallow one. But I, I, I crawled up in one. That one up the creek. That's about thirty feet. It was kind of a warmer day during the winter and i only had to dip my head under for a second because i could see in there and i, I had a light because i wanted to do it because i saw that jeremiah johnson yeah so i when i popped up inside of it i was surprised at how clean it was on the inside you know oh, the yeah. outside looks did they have chaotic. Did it, was there furniture in there because <laughs> well they, look it was, actually, it was like there's, little there's, there's tunnels just, <laughs> it was like here's the living room so look, I'm sitting here checking this thing out with a light, but then I sensed I was not alone. <laughs> so when I turned around with the light, I'm telling you, it's a 40 pound beaver looking at me. And he went, and I, <laughs> in beaver language, exit. In yeah. beaver language is like the guy when we all were duck cutting. We had all the doors locked. We're in a cheap motel. There's about three rooms, kind of like a little deal, whatever you call it. There was three rooms, one door, but three different rooms. Oh, that was we're, in Idaho. Idaho. Oh. We're all asleep yeah. or Oregon or somewhere. And about three o'clock in the morning, I heard the 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 door lock. I heard a little little sound. So I, I thought, then I noticed someone is trying to jimmy the door, trying to get in the get in the door. So I reached over and I had a Benelli shotgun at the time. I reached over and grabbed that. I was sitting in my underwear. I, I, got, I just leaned up on the edge of the bed and it was, it was, I was shooting from the hip. I clicked it off safety and I was just sitting there waiting on that door to open because I knew it wasn't any of us. So the door comes open this way and this guy steps in and he looks down there and sees me in my underwear with these whiskers and that Benelli pointed at his gut. And I didn't say anything. I was just sitting there. He said his hands came up like I told him, but I didn't say anything. He just went, he raised his hands. He said, wrong room. I said, 
I just <laughs> nodded. You are correct. <clears throat> yeah. He backs out. I go around on the door, get an angle on him to see if he had a weapon or something. And he's going across the parking lot. And he looked back and saw me standing there with that gun. And he got his hands up higher like, so that was my introduction or, or Oregon's introduction to the duck man. That's called criminal. <laughs> but anyway, criminal I'm all, so in beaver language, well, that scene was. Hey, yeah. That was the beaver language saying wrong room. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But anyway, I'm going to give it to the beavers. They're going to dam it up. The oak timber will die. I've planted thousands of cypress out there way back thinking one day we may just have to get let the beavers have it instead of cutting out all their dams leave them and let them make a lake out of it like they so, want to so you've now you this is you you've waved the white flag i i, I give up you be the beavers well, this won is, this is a big day this is a moment big day yeah, yeah. 25 years you're sharing a moment with us today and and the great news is once you allow them to have their lake like they wanted to, and I was getting in the way, I didn't want to kill the timber right. at the time. But the trees are We're dead, talking right? 100 acres here that would be a permanent pool. Yep. 100 acres of oak timber, but I'd already spot cut it to get whatever timber was worth anything. I right. saw this coming way back. So the bottom line is I'm giving it to the beavers. Uh, the the uh, water regime now will be up higher year-round, 100 acres of water permanent. It'll help us with the blue wing teal for sure. Well, we'll yeah, we're going to rip the blue rip wing them. teal. Because the one year this happened where this water <laughs> flooded for this amount of time, because we can't pull the water off now because the river stayed up so long, because then it has to dry out. It's just a constant you, you battle. you got to till the ground to plant it. Well, that's never going to happen this year, so you leave it. That's why the beavers were right all along, because they're like, you can't control the water here because you have years that the water just stays here. Up to this year, we would drain it. And then I would pump it back up after I planted the mud flats. We opened up enough of it where we could have grass and all. Now it will change over to like duckweed, floating green duck seed. Mm. Duck but it'll weed. mainly be a resting hole. Resting hole. So Coontail moss, aquatics. And who says that rednecks can't live at one with nature? <clears throat> it just took a few years to figure that, figure that out. You have right? to, we just, I've decided to work with whatever's thrown at me, which in this case is beef. I'm going to work with them. I'm going to give it to them. They'll love it. And the great news is they will maintain it. Yeah. They'll, yeah. If any, they get a leak or something, they'll come in there and fix it because you can go cut a hole in one of them dams. You right. come back the next morning, it's like you were never there. It's all back in there, just like they just come in at night, patch it back up. They hear, they hear that water running. That's why Si had the idea, you know, yeah. about – playing the tape with the water yeah, running yep. from the show yeah it's actually not a bad idea sometimes he comes up with some stuff so in our in our bible study i guess this is a perfect lead because um we left off in right around genesis 6 the world's in bad shape sin violence every thought and so we kind of introduced noah last time <clears throat> which brings an interesting thought when you think about beavers and all the other animals that the ark so so god speaks directly to noah who is the only righteous man out of all of mankind however many were there and i don't know how many you know had been there from genesis 1 to or genesis 2 to you get to genesis 6 but everybody else is bad it's all bad all the time we're, we're down to eight we're down to eight because you had noah and his wife he had three sons and they were married <clears throat> so you got you know basically eight people that still believe in the original connection to God. Everybody else, out. I mean, just, you know, that's what the Bible tells us. It's really not that hard to believe. If that's you, right. If you fast forward about, in our, by our count, roughly 7,000 years, and you look at the human race, right. I can see how everyone could go, go bad. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and you see it because it, it encroaches. It, it starts on a culture. Look at our culture just sure. in 300 years. Or I guess probably 400 once you go back to the original people. So you look at the situation. So so Noah gets the word from the Almighty that there's going to be a judgment that's going to come. It's going to come in the form of water. And so he's you know it's every, it's going to be a just great flood. <clears throat> and up until this point, you look back in the in the garden. There were these mists and all this, but I don't know that the, you know it. It seems to give you the impression in Genesis that there had not been a 
major rainfall like whatever yeah, if ever i've heard that before I, yeah i think they get no that rain from Mist. hebrews uh 11 you know the faith chapter when it goes through all the people of faith in the old testament <clears throat> right in verse 7 it says by faith noah when warned about things not yet seen including rain that, that that's right. i think the idea that it hadn't rained it was just it was the water was coming from the springs or, or the, and mist. the mist that, that was there. You see that in the garden. Very lush. Right. But it says in holy fear, built an ark to save his family by his faith. He condemned the world and, beca- and he became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So it's interesting. So, so it's somewhere and it took him somewhere between 75 and a hundred years, depending on, you know, there's a lot of, you know, scholarship about how long it took. It was at least 75 years <clears throat> to build this boat. Now, by the way, I just was in Lexington, Kentucky, speaking this last week. So some group uh, of apologists, Christian apologists, have built an ark from the specifications of the Bible <clears throat> that's the exact duplicate of what the Bible laid out for, for Noah to build. I, I went and saw the thing. I bet that was quite the boat. It, I mean, just that first view of it, when you look and you see the whole thing, you just, you just can't believe it. Is it know? like inside a building? No. Or? It's like what they did was like one side of it is just the boat. And then the other side of it, they built on some things to it. So when you're walking through it, they've got all these you know thing, videos playing and t- talking, not just about knowing the art, but about creation, you know, all these different things. So it was really just a... I think they built it as an evangelistic tool to be able to show people, look, this is here's how it could have happened. It, it's it, plausible. It's plausible. That that's the whole point. But of the biggest building. argument I've always heard about that from people non-believers is they say, well, the ark couldn't have been big enough to hold all the animals. Did they address that? They did. The- <clears throat> and what? And I hadn't thought about it before. They did address it, and so they got all these the cages where where you have all the animals. And of course, they had you know they had little dinosaurs and everything else in there, which was kind of an old earth, young earth argument. But the, their what the way they addressed it was, they said God would have sent juvenile animals. It wouldn't have been full size. We think you know you think that all the pictures you see of these full size, but right. if it was all if it was too little small of whatever it is, valid you know, point, <laughs> which is a pretty good point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If they were all juveniles, you know, so they had little beavers. If you had big big beavers, by the time the flood was over, they would have they'd have eaten a hole. They would have had boat. a hole in the boat. The boat sinks, and then I oh, blame it on the beavers. <laughs> That's no. right. So they had all these juvenile animals, but it, it was it was really incredible because I mean. It's like looking at a cruise ship, but the way this thing was built. Of course, now they didn't have, you know, they there was a lot of talk about what gopher wood, you know, was it cypress? <clears throat> the, the guess was it was cypress, which would make sense, you know, because nobody can find out what a gopher wood. That's an ancient term. There's no such thing now as a gopher tree or whatever that was. Well, maybe that was lost in translation. Exactly. Maybe. So I fi- they figured cypress, uh, some cedar they talked about just because of the region. Uh, plus, it had like layers didn't it two or three layers oh my goodness it had decks and so and then of course up in the top of it you had the like a skylight type thing so it it brought down light and the way they built this thing the light shined down into the ship it just kind of ref, reflects and refracted off all the way to the bottom <clears throat> so you, you could actually see in there and all it had was some holes hmm. in the top of it how Very long was this thing roughly Did i think it, 500 well, feet bible says it gives the dimension. right i think it was i think it was it was 500 yards i don't know i can't remember it, it was yeah. it was longer than a football field and half well, 500 as yards would be five five football fields. well okay so it was it was yeah what's a what's a football field 100 yards which is what 330 feet 300 feet 300 feet 300 feet so 300 so 500 feet. feet it was it was a it was a, a football field plus some i got you that's how long it was. i would have thought it would have been bigger well i'm telling you you just it's hard to imagine it I'm so glad well, they built big. it. That's yeah. big. When you when you go to a football stadium, you think if this was a ship. So they show ship. in their basically, <laughs> and the animals were given after their kinds. So he didn't have all the animals that eventually right. came right. out of all and that. Things. Right. That's why I said things. You know, evolve in sure. a sense. You know, I mean that the way God set it all up, and that's the way they had the animals pictured inside. Here was this kind. 
Yep. He was this kind. So it wasn't every particular what's, one in that. What's crazy to me is they used the argument that Cy used when, you know, because he thinks there are black panthers in the woods now. You know, he's seen them, jaguars running around, because oh, everybody yeah. around in Louisiana has this. But, but what's funny is he used the same argument when we put a black tomcat in front of his deer cam because we were going to – he was going to – say he had visual evidence now of seeing a black panther yeah, in the woods. This was a setup. It was a setup. We were going to say, "Sir, we put a black tomcat." But that was his argument. He when he saw the picture, he's like, "Well, I got evidence now. I, here it is." I said, "Sir, we put the tomcat in front of your camera." He's like, "Hadn't you ever heard of a baby panther?" <laughs> <laughs> Which is, so, leave it to side to find the same type of argument. <laughs> would be the argument of, of why but the animals. I work. think that uh, the here's my take on the on the whole deal. You have here's God, creator of atoms, molecules. He makes a man from dust. He arrives on Earth from a virgin, which is impossible, you know, right. for man. So I think when people try to go in and and find discrepancies in the Bible. And like try to put God in the box, you can't put him in a box. He he controls atoms and molecules. He can heal you, you know, in a second. He can calm the storm, like you know where Phil started. He so to try to trap like oh the you know the ark wasn't big enough to hold all the animals. Look, he can do what he wants <laughs> when it comes to atoms and molecules, and he's making planets and and galaxies, and it, it he just you can't think in your human mind and put him in that type he of could box. have filled in all the blanks oh he did fill in all the blanks. just make them. yeah <laughs> that's right so, but i just think the human mind can't conceive that that's why i became a human that's why i became jesus it always comes back to that something we can relate to but i'm always just perplexed at why people try to find some little deficiency in their right. mind in the bible like oh well this doesn't fit well, you know, you're just not going to make God fit in your mind. That That's why you spend your life. Well, that's an interesting point because <clears throat> now there were all these people there walking through this recreation of the ark, and most of them were people of faith. You could tell, you know, just from here, listening to the conversation. So we walked, and so was I. I, was, we, I walked through in a wonderment, you know, of like, wow, look what God did here. I mean, like, I never doubted for a second that this wasn't, you know, and it could have been, you know, they took some artistic lives. But I'm saying I looked at it, it brought more reality to what I believe. Yeah. And so that's the difference in how you look at it. Somebody else may come in there. there I'm sure there were some skeptics or Oh, yeah, they're coming in there saying not big enough. And then not, they're looking you know. at everything and thinking, well, that wouldn't work. And If and, you think about it, it's Genesis 6, for crying out loud, not too far from back to creation. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it logically, you say... How in the world, if someone came along 7,000 years later and built a replica of this thing, it would be beyond human logic or reasoning to even have the concept of a boat this size That's right. back then, Built by and ancients. it's going to take you 100 years to build it. Well, especially if it and had never rained. And you're I'm telling saying everybody. you read the story and you say, how in the world could this kind of story and the story of a great flood is within all cultures, the Chinese culture. Oh, yeah. They all they alluded been. to this big water, this That's big right. water That's right. throughout <laughs> history. What's interesting, I talked to some of these creationist guys who are, are, are scientists, but they are creation right. scientists. Right. And... One of them told me, he said, that's what convinced me to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He said, when I studied on a secular, with a secular group, he said, I was an atheist. And he said, my, my cup of tea, my expertise was going to be study the flood to show that it's a myth, a fairy tale, and all that. Shut it down. So they had a narrative. It's, it's all a hoax. This this biblical story of this great boat couldn't have happened in the in the flood that came with it couldn't have happened no way. He said the further I went in my studies, I noticed he said I would get pushback every time I would say like guys, I'm telling you, I'm up in these mountains, I'm seeing these uh, fossilized 
sea creatures in all the mountain ranges on planet Earth, shells and snails, and they're in the, been bedded in these rocks on top of these places where there has, as far as we can tell, there was no water to get this stuff. He said, the more I studied it, the more I had my doubts that there wasn't a flood. Right. He said, well, the day came when I finally got the ax. They cut me off because I was researching it saying, guys, the more I look at this, I'm saying it's a possibility there was a big water. Yeah. They're like, what in the world are you talking? We didn't put you down there. So it, it went against the narrative. Right. Well, he ends up ostracized, and he ended up with the creation scientists and saying, Based on our study, it could have happened. So the people that built this recreation, the doors on the thing, are, I don't know how big they are, massive. And so I took a picture of them. And <clears throat> with no power tools. That's right. And so here's what's interesting. So they do a thing about doorway to salvation. And so what these guys did was these massive doors, and people are taking pictures in front of it. But they had a light shining from somewhere, and it put a shadow of a cross on these two massive doors because then they went into the whole deal about the, the doorway to salvation, which everybody, you know, think about it, everybody, all the animals and Noah and his family that went in through those doors, those doors were shut and that was it. Nobody else got in, which was this idea of judgment. But then they kind of made the leap forward about Jesus saying, talking about himself being a doorway, a door plus, to salvation. Plus Noah, out of all the people on earth, there was one man that Chase quoted a while ago, one man who believed in the water. Right. Well, if you believe in the water, that's the, his faith that saved him because when God said build a boat because I'm going to flood the earth with water, do you believe this? Well, Noah was like, mm. okay. So he begins to own a hundred year carpenter job to build a boat because his faith, he said, I believe there's a water coming. And I'm telling everybody, he warned everybody that came up there. Right. They thought he was an idiot. Yep. No one believed in the water, but no one. Peter alludes to that. And he, he oh, uh, yeah, the first Peter three, I was, I was thinking that. Let me, let me just read that. Yeah, I, right. I think it's an interesting take yeah uh, yeah i mean the way here we are first peter how 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 long after the ark was this written i mean oh, it would have been 3500 years so uh, 30, 4, 000, yeah, at least 400 years later you know peter writes that for christ died for sins once for all because it always goes back to yeah like what i said which is why they came up with the cross which is i'm guarantee is where they got this idea us relating to god's going to come back to jesus and then it says uh, he was he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago, in the days uh, of Noah, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. I'm not really sure what that means about Jesus going back and all that, but right. then all of a sudden he brings up Noah and the ark, and it says, in it, the ark, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water, which I guess the idea of the water pushed the ark right. up you're, you're above. Up. Yeah, above the, I mean, you needed that boat. <laughs> and then it says we're saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism, that now saves you also. It's not the removal of dirt from the body, you know, like taking a bath, like you're washing the spiritual off, but it's the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven as at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. I mean, I think this is one of the most, for a lot of people, one of the most confusing passages because mm -hmm. you have this analogy between Noah and the ark and then baptism so one thing I know that stands out here the actual baptism that we participate is involved in water because a lot of people say well you're not baptized in water but he mm -hmm. the symbol was water yeah most people say baptism is the symbol 
But he's saying water symbolizes baptism. That is correct. And it's not that the water is saving you. He goes on to say that right. Jesus Christ is what saves you. Right. That that's obvious. Yep. So I think it's it's uh I think it really makes you grasp the power number one of Jesus, which is number one, his death, burial, and resurrection. But then there's a way to symbolize that Noah faith. Despite everybody saying, what are you doing? That's are right. you crazy? No. The entire world was saying no. Yeah. And he was saying yes. And he was right. Yeah. And I, I think also it's it's you. It's not you performing some work yourself. This right. was God's plan. That's right. That's why when, I, when people come to me and sometimes they say, well, you're saved through grace. I'm like, yes, Ephesians 2. It, it's, it's clear. Grace, God's grace on a cross is what saves you. But he also chose a way for you to trust and surrender to him, which I think when you when you take baptism for what it is, you're actually not doing anything but surrendering. That's right. You know, it's a humbling thing to let allow someone to dunk you in, in the water. And you realize that it's not really about the water. It's about that conscience of, yeah, right. I'm going to give my life to Jesus because right. that's what what which you can me. see why it parallels so He's well. He's basically Noah. zeroing in on when the who is Jesus, the how is through your faith, like right. Noah, and you're told Jesus is the one who said, "I have all the authority in heaven and on earth." Therefore, go make disciples, and you baptize them. Well, well, there's the water. Well, you got orders from headquarters. So to us, in a lot of ways. The ark, yeah. Jesus is our ark. That's right. We believe. You, you say you said do what? He said go make disciples and baptize them. We got all these baptism verses. Well, You're, without the ark, without the plan, you you drown. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. only way you're going to escape this thing, the water. If you believe it's coming, do you believe it's coming? Everybody said no. I mean, it hadn't rained yet. And they see this guy built on a boat out on dry ground, and they say, what are you doing? He said, there's a big water coming. And they said, here? There's <laughs> going to be water here? And they said, "Peter, I mean, uh, Noah said, oh, yeah, it's coming. No one believed it but Noah. Well, the good news is because of his faith in what God said, I'm going to flood the earth with H2O. <laughs> The springs, the rain, the, the oceans are springs from, I'm going to flood the whole thing. You believe it, Noah? He said, I believe there's a coming water. And, and so what now? He said, you're going to need a boat. Start building it. Right. And that's how he was saved. And look, by his faith, he condemned the world. Look, the water, their unbelief in it, killed them. That's right. It's just like us. We hear, what do you want me to do? He said, Repent and be baptized, all of you, in the name of Jesus. Well, some guy told me one time, he said, you think that all these baptism verses are alluding to water, unless you're born again of water and the Spirit. John the Baptist is taking him into the Jordan River, a right. stream of H2O. Well, I went through all these texts. He was saying spiritual water. That's just a, an analogy. It's really not – he's not talking about water. Well, when I got to this verse – First Peter, I said, what kind of water drowned everyone but Noah and, and his family? What kind of water was that? Was that spiritual water or was that rain water, H2O? He said, that was H2O. I said, we finally identified <laughs> water. So I read him this text, and he looked at the ground, and he said, he was a preacher. He said, I've never seen that before until right now. And I said, why don't you just do it? Go to the water, mm -hmm. let someone baptize you, go baptize them, just like Jesus said. Right. You got all these texts, it have they have to mean something. Jesus himself said, Where did water baptism come from? Where did John's baptism come from? He asked a group that wouldn't let John baptize him. Right. They were just standing there saying, Nah, we don't fool with that. We're under the law of Moses here. We don't have to do this, you know, by faith and that you're gonna be the, save the world. This is pre death, burial and resurrection. Right. He said, where'd it come from? Well, it's the question of the ages. Right. Well, they said, if we say men, no, he, they said, where's if we, that at? Where's it, that verse at? It's about like Mark 11. Uh, 
it, it, they when they when he asked him where did water baptism come from because they had asked him how do you have the authority who gave you the authority to perform these miracles and and they wouldn't believe that he had just fried a fig tree looked like he sprayed it with roundup they said <laughs> who gave you this authority he said let me ask you something john's baptism and luke 7 says they rejected god's purpose for themselves for they had not been baptized by John. So here's a group saying, we don't need this baptism thing being pushed down in the water. We ain't buying it. So by what authority are you doing these things, they ask. This is Mark 11, about verse 28. I will ask you one question. Answer me, and then I'll tell you about that. And I, then I'll, I, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things if you'll tell me one, answer one question. John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from men? Well, that's the text of the ages. Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, if water baptism came from heaven, he's going to ask Jesus, then why didn't you believe him? How come you didn't let him baptize you? If it's from heaven, they said, well, we can't say that because he's got us. If we say from men, men dreamed up water baptism. That's like right now in modern day planet Earth, where in America someone says, Do y'all baptize people? You say, We baptize people. Jesus said, Baptize them. We never heard of baptism till Jesus showed up. When he showed up, we noticed the guy paving the way for him started baptizing people. Well, a lot of them rejected it and said no. To those people, Jesus said, Well, where did it come from? From heaven or men? They said, we can't say heaven because he's going to say, why didn't you let him baptize you? So if we say from men, they feared the people for everyone held that John was a prophet. So if we say baptism came from men, water baptism, then all the guys that John's been baptizing, they're going to say, are y'all crazy? The man's from God. He's telling you what to do. Put your faith in what Jesus is going to do. Repent. It was a baptism of repentance. Repent. Repent. But they wouldn't do it. So they answered Jesus after they talked it over, we don't know. We don't know where water baptism came from. <laughs> Have no idea. Now what do you say? He we said, should tell you, something. you know what he said? <laughs> Neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. If you can't believe that I perform a miracle and I burn a, I fry a fig tree, and if you say, whoever did that, <clears throat> we need to listen to him. We need to follow him. Which is the point to me when people – argue about baptism because i think it comes from it came from some some uh hypothetical situation all this argument came from a hypothetical situation in my opinion people say well what happens if somebody doesn't get baptized, don't get baptized but they had and, faith and they right. have faith and i never even i'm like what why are we trying to build some kind of philosophy and God teaching? makes that call? Well, right. yeah, off of some some hypothetical. It's like us humans are down here, you know, setting aside the awesome greatness of God's plan, and you know, for some hypothetical situation that we want to make sense of. And my point is, when people understand Jesus, oh, they they run to the. They run to the water. They do. You can reenact Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in water. Oh, they're running. You couldn't keep them out of there. It's a beautiful it, thing. Oh, but, it, it's and so I always say people don't understand baptism, in my opinion. They don't understand Jesus. You say, well, what do you do? You don't give them a bunch of baptism verses because Jesus is what saves. Right. Jesus is what motivates. Jesus is the reason. So they see that just like the analogy that Peter used in 1 Peter 3. He was going back to Noah and the ark, and then he showed how this pledge saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The water symbolizes baptism back in his day. Well, if I read that, I'm like, I'm running. I'm running to some water. Me too. By the way, there was this was one illustration that Peter used in 1 Peter 3. Paul used another one in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 where he talked about the cloud being over the Israelites as the Red Sea is on both sides. And, he's, and he used baptism in that picture because they were under the water yeah. when they were coming out of there. You, the, the Hebrew writer talked about the, the cleansing water going into the temple. So you see these little, these all the New Testament writers look back and said, look, yeah. these are all symbols. God's known 
he was going to make this part of it the whole time. The Israelites didn't know because they weren't baptized. But like you said, John comes along and Jesus comes and it's like, mm-hmm. now there's a chance. This is what the covenant, this is what Judaism, this is what the Old Testament, it was always about this. I think, so, I think <coughs> baptism is camouflaged too and victory. You think if you're in a war, the last thing you would think to win the war would be to surrender. You, that When somebody waves the white flag, you're like, well, he lost. But when you think about what Jesus did, he basically waved the white flag on the cross. That's right. And what? That was his way to victory over the evil one and triumph over sin by actually doing the opposite of what you think, which is surrendering. That's right. Was, which, in, in contrast, gave us the victory. Yep. I think baptism is the same thing. So when people use that argument about what are you saying? That's some kind of work that you physically do. I think it's the same camouflage as the cross of Jesus. You're obtaining victory through actually no no legal action of yourselves. You're giving giving it all completely up, right? Because you're coming in contact with the ultimate victory, right. which is the blood of Jesus and that resurrection. Yeah, that's perfect. I think one of the greatest examples I see in the Old Testament, uh, and it wasn't even about baptism. Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram, 2 Kings 5. Here's a great uh, metaphor. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. Old Naaman had one problem, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken a young girl captive from Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his lep- leprosy. Old Naaman needs to go to that prophet over there, and, and he'll, he'll cure him. Well, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him some gold, silver. And with this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Take care of this thing for me. <clears throat> well, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? <clears throat> when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man, Naaman, come to me, And he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. The girl, the slave girl, had said, look, you need to get in cuts with this Elisha. He'll take care of it. He'll cure you of his leprosy. The king of Israel said, what in the world? He sent him a letter. He said, I can't do this. Well, here comes Naaman with his little troop. He pulls out in front of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha's in the house. He said, uh, who's out there? He said, well, some guy got leprosy, <clears throat> and he's come to you to cure him. What, what do you want to do? Elisha said, uh, go out there and tell him to go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you'll be cleansed. Tell him to go down down to Jordan, dip seven times. I didn't say one time. I didn't say three times. <coughs> You're adding. I that said. Far, right? I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> He's paraphrasing. <coughs> he should have said. Well, you know, one would have done it. Okay, but he said no. Tell him to dip seven, and I mean seven. Well, Naaman went away angry. He said, "I went to this prophet who's supposed to be this big healer, and he sends word to me through a little old servant. Said, hey, he said, go down on the river, dip yourself seven times. You'd be good in the Jordan now, in the Jordan River." Dip seven times, you're good to go. Naaman, he's angry. He's the one with the leprosy. His hides are rotting off of him. <laughs> I thought that he, Elisha, would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord. He and wanted wave, a big show. Wave his hand big over show. the spot and cure me. He said, I thought, you know, this is going to be a big deal here. That's right. Go to the Jordan River and watch. Are not Abana and uh, far par the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel. What's just me crossing two rivers to get over there to another? What's the death? He was making about the water. A river's yeah. a river. Yeah, this water. So what? Couldn't I be washed in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in a rage. He's eaten up with leprosy. 
And the man of God said, go down on the Jordan River, dip seven times, you'll be all right. He said, go down to the Jordan River, what? Naaman's servants came to him, and they said, listen, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? He's made this thing easy for you. Mm -hmm. We know which river to go to. We know how many times you need to get dipped in the thing. Dip yourself seven times. Why don't we just do it? Well, so he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan. He finally said, all right, that's what he said. I'll do it. White flag. Yeah. He dipped seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Here's the point. It wasn't the water, That's right. but he had to go to the right river, and it was H2O flowing down it. You say, but that's not what cleansed the leprosy. God cleansed him. That's right. That's what baptism is a like. As yeah. ridiculous as it was. As Just ridiculous like as it, it no was. No one Everybody thought that was ridiculous. Right. It's not it, baptismal regeneration. There's yeah. power in H2O. That's, it's your. It, you, it's an act of faith. You say, what God said. It's bigger than baptism. Our whole life seems ridiculous to the world. Every time you think, you know, people are like, Oh, this is so silly that you're following Jesus and believing all this hocus pocus. And somehow you you're going to die to sin and be yeah. buried the you notice, old you in did a you pool notice of water. That the servants, servant mindset, servant, serve other people. They had no problem believing. Yeah, he just said it. Go do it. The prideful guy who had the wealth and the power and the he was the one that was like, who, well, who are you? To? His whole response was just what you're describing. Every so time, the idea is submit. You, yeah. you said it, which is the perfect segue to end our podcast. Every, every time I see a big rain or a rainbow, I think, oh, yeah, I'm on the winning team. It, it's real simple. <laughs> Noah, there's a big water coming. Do you believe I'm telling you the truth? There's a big water coming. You're going to need a boat. Do you believe this? Noah said, Big water coming, what I need to do, build a boat. He said, okay. His faith right. in the coming water saved yeah. him because he's the only one, he and his family, that had a boat. <laughs> so we started the podcast with Phil raising the white flag to the beavers. You win after 40 years. We end the podcast by saying we raise the white flag and surrender to Christ. That's right. That's what saves us perfect way to end our podcast today next time we'll talk about sort of what happens after that because obviously everybody dies except for eight people so we kind of got to reboot the whole system and we, we, get, we take them to the water Al, just like naaman went to the water all the time and you we say, get the next week we get the birthplace of hunting that's exactly Genesis right this is nine you do not want to miss it. It's going to be really good. So uh, we'll see you next time on Unashamed Podcast. Be sure and tell your friends about it. iTunes, YouTube, Blaze TV. Uh, you can find it in all these different places. And uh, I know I'm getting a lot of feedback from folks. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, Sexton from West Virginia, sent me this hat. So that's for you. And I'm getting a lot of great comments for everybody about the podcast. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And tell other people about it. My final line to Neil Cavuto when we were talking about these matters, about all the words that ended in ism, I told him, I said, Neil, I believe in two words that come from, that have ISM behind them, baptism and capitalism. I said, those two I embrace. God, God gave us one and our government gave us the other one. I said, I, I, I believe in both of them. There you go. Perfect, perfect. All the rest of them, no, sir. Perfect philosophy. <laughs> 